Okay, all good. If you're still working on it, you can finish it uh, offline. Much appreciated for that. Uh, let's carry on and talk a little bit about uh, the final project. <clears throat> so uh, last time uh, I showed you, I updated the schedule here, so there's now a link to the oral presentation schedule. As I mentioned last time, we're on a very tight time schedule. Everyone has exactly three minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, I had a little bug down here, so I had to shave down our two 10-minute breaks to two 7-minute breaks. I don't believe all of the 43 presentations are going to actually happen, so we probably have a little bit more breathing room than you can see here in the, uh, the schedule. Um, even if you are presenting later in the morning, please do be here at 7.30 to support your fellow students. And as promised, there will also be donuts and coffee here. So you can get your sugar and caffeine injections uh, at 7.30 before we get started. Okay, here's the oral presentation schedule. Uh, I also updated the document describing the final project. Here's the link to it down here from the schedule. So this document now has three parts to it. Uh, there is the uh, discussion about weekly deliverables, which is not, uh, not important to us anymore. Just to keep in mind, your final project as a whole is worth 30% uh, of your grade. The graduate students had nine weekly deliverables at 2% uh, apiece. So the grad students in their uh, final presentations are going to be assessed for 12% of their grade. Undergraduates, you, you uh, handed in four weekly deliverables. So your final presentation is going to be worth a little bit more. Make sense? Okay. So if you scroll down through this document, you will now see a section about the written report and the oral presentation, and I believe all the information is there. I want to just walk through this very quickly so we're all on the same page. Okay, the written report is uh, going to be a PDF document that you're submitting uh, the night before um, our oral presentations, which are Thursday morning, so Wednesday, May the 10th. Uh, it has to be in at 11.59 p.m. We need everything uh, submitted in Blackboard by 11.59 p.m. Because immediately after the oral presentations on Thursday morning, the TA and myself are going to start grading everything. So there are no late extensions uh, on either the written report or the oral presentation. All right? Okay. Uh, PDF document, please make sure it's a PDF if we can't open your document for some reason. Uh, you know what the answer is. Okay, uh, at least four pages, double space, 12 point font. Um, grad students, this would be worth 6% of your final grade. The oral presentation is worth, the oral presentation is worth 6% of your grade, adding up to that total of 12%. Okay. Undergrads, uh, your written report is worth 11%. What are we looking for in the written report? Well, in the written report, there are going to be uh, four sections. More or less one page per section here. We will be deducting points for poor writing quality, so please communicate your ideas clearly to us. The main thing we're looking for in the written report is a description of the functionality you've added since the last deliverable. There was some confusion about this last year. We're looking for you to continue on with your, your project up until Wednesday. So you're going to be describing the added functionality you put in since you submitted your last weekly uh, deliverable. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, four sections for this written report. The first one is going to describe your goals. What were you originally trying to do? What were, very briefly, your, um, what were your individual stepping stones uh, to get there? How close did you get to your final goal? So as I mentioned several times by now, we're not looking for you to implement some ambitious project, but to have some goal in mind and demonstrate to us that you're able to break this down into stepping stone stones towards those goals. Which of those stepping stones did you implement? Did you have to change your idea about what was possible given the limitations of PyroSim or, or what have you? Right? So that's, that's really what we're, we're looking for. Okay, second section, this is like the methods section of a research paper. You de you're describing how you implemented your project, right? Um, we're not looking for you to copy and paste uh, code here. We're not looking for pseudocode. We're looking for a general description of how you implemented your, your project. 
what did you have to change on the robot side? What did you have to change on the evolutionary algorithm side? What did you have to change on the artificial neural network side? What did you have to change in terms of the robot's environment? That, that sort of thing. Okay, third section is probably for us the most interesting one, which is the results, right? So here you're going to include figures or screenshots to demonstrate that you actually were able to evolve your, your robot or robots, plural, um, to do what you wanted them to do. The main thing you're trying to communicate to us is that you were actually able to do some evolution. So we want to see some visualization or some way of proving to us in this section that there's a significant difference between some evolved robots and those that are just random, right? So that could be a screenshot. It could be fitness curves. We've seen a lot of fitness curves. How does fitness go up over time? Is the fitness after 100 generations significantly higher than the fitness in the initial population of random uh, robots? We've seen a lot of different ways of visualizing evolved behavior throughout this course. This is a good place to try out some of those. Uh, you might remember the footprint graphs, which are a way to visualize um, how regular a gait your robot is exhibiting. We saw phylogenetic trees. Uh, if you remember the minimal cognition experiments, there were some pretty involved figures there trying to demonstrate in a single figure what a robot is doing over, over time. Okay, that's up to you. Okay, final section, what you're, uh, in the final section, I want you to demonstrate to us that you thought carefully about your final project, right? Some of you may have initially proposed something pretty ambitious and you weren't able to get there given the limitations of PyroSim and the computational limitations of your laptop or whatever, right? So what, when you were implementing your project, what was surprisingly difficult? What was surprisingly easy? In retrospect, why do you think that was uh, the case? If you had another year to work on this project, how would you expand your project? Um, what new features would you want PyroSim to have in order to achieve this? What aspects of the expanded project do you think would be relatively easy? Which things would you set aside more time to work on? Uh, and so on. You don't need to answer every single one of these questions. I'm just trying to give you a feel for what we're looking for in this, in this final section. Right? You all have a fair bit of experience now with physics engines and robots and artificial neural networks and evolutionary optimization. What would you do if you had a whole year to continue your, your project? Okay, any questions about the written report? Okay, let's move on to the oral presentation. Uh, it is also due uh, at 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, May the 10th. And especially this one, you need to get this in by 11.59 p.m. because at 12.01 a.m., we are going to start stitching together all the oral presentations into a YouTube playlist with 43 three-and-a-half-minute videos in it. So if we don't have your video to add to the playlist, you're out of luck, right? We're gonna, we have a very tight schedule on Thursday morning. There's not gonna be time to stop the playlist and bring up your YouTube video that was created after this, this time. So do make sure to get your, your uh, video submitted by then. There's where to submit it. Again, uh, like usual, you're submitting a URL that points to a YouTube video. Make sure that it's set to a public setting so we can, or at least an unlisted setting, so at least we can get access to it and include it in the playlist. If there's some formatting issue, or for some reason we can't add it to the playlist, you're out of luck. Okay. Again, it needs to be exactly three minutes uh, and 30 uh, seconds. A uh, useful tool might be YouTube has its own video editor, so you can pull together some of the videos of your evolved and random robots. Uh, you can pull in slides and all sorts of things and make your video exactly 3 minutes and 30 seconds. As I mentioned before, uh, no need for any audio on the presentation. You're going to come up and talk over your video as it plays. Okay. For the grad students, it's worth 6% uh, of your final grade, and undergrads, it's 11% of your final grade. Um, like the report, your oral presentation needs to have these four uh, components. What was it that you were trying to achieve? Goals. How did you achieve it? Methods. What did you achieve? The results. In that third results section in the oral presentation, 
the centerpiece of your results is going to be, here's a video of a random robot or random robots. Here's a video of my evolved robot. And you can clearly see by comparing these two videos that the evolved robot is doing a better job of X than the random robot. Right? That's the easiest way to demonstrate to all of us that you were able to successfully evolve your robot or robots to do something. If you have time and you want to show other figures and graphs, fitness curves and footprint uh, graphs, that's, that's fine too. But do make sure to convince us that you actually were able to evolve uh, something. And then finally, the fourth section again could just be a slide embedded in your video with a number of bullet points just showing us that you've thought carefully about your project, what was hard, what was easy. If you had a year to continue the project, what would you, what would you do? Make sense? Uh, we will not, unfortunately, because we have such a large class, we won't have time for a question and answers. Um, the break periods that we have, do make sure to ask your fellow students questions about their, their projects. This is your, your chance to do so. Okay. Uh, I mentioned this again, but I think it, it's worth saying again. We're going to run this playlist uh, without stopping. So when your video ends, you end. And the next student's video will start playing, and that student will be coming up to the front of the class to tell us about their project. So everybody needs to stay on time. Three minutes and 30 seconds is not a lot of time. Practice your presentation beforehand. OK, I think that covers just about everything. Any questions about the final project? Okay, um, I have my office hours after class today for an hour, so if you have any last minute questions about implementation details, uh, come and see me then. Kevin will be holding his office hours uh, on Thursday. After that, it will probably be pretty difficult to get in contact with Kevin or I. I will try and make room in my schedule if you have any last minute uh, burning issues, but I would try and see either myself or Kevin uh, this week if you're having issues with PyroSim or your final final project. Any other questions? No? We're all good? Okay. We are almost, almost at the end uh, of the course. We've got uh, two lectures to go. We're going to uh, talk about robots that can adapt like animals today. Uh, on Thursday, I will be here, but we'll also be joined by Nick Cheney. Uh, who took this class a few years back uh, and is now, he just graduated his PhD studies uh, at Cornell, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his work in uh, soft uh, robotics. Okay, so lecture 26 today, uh, Robots That Can Adapt Like Animals. This lecture is not so much about evolving bodies and brains. It is more about robots that are adapting in the face of unexpected situations, which might, if your memory serves you well, remind you of Lecture 17, where we talked about the evil starfish, the resilient uh, robot, where we pulled off one of its legs and it was able to adapt and keep moving despite that, that damage. I apologize. We should have talked about Lecture 26 back in the Crossing the Reality Gap um, theme. So it doesn't really belong to this theme, but uh, regardless. OK. So robots that can adapt uh, like animals. There's a video, five-minute video summary, and we'll come back to the video uh, in a moment. Um, this is very recent work in the field. This was published in uh, Nature just a couple of, of years ago. Got a lot of uh, attention because, again, demonstrating something that's very difficult for machines to do, which is to adapt to unforeseen circumstances. So running throughout this course, we've sort of looked at some of the building blocks of intelligence. One of the main building blocks, if not the building block of intelligence, is adaptation, right? Experiencing a situation that neither you nor any of your ancestors has experienced and being able to thrive or at least survive that situation. Okay. Animals and humans are pretty good uh, at this. Um, we're going to, uh, in this project, they worked with this uh, physical hexapod here. Um, now, in 2015, everything was done on board the robot back when we did a resilient machines project back in 2006. The evil starfish was evolving simulations of self 
uh, offline. We have an RGB D camera. What does RGB and D stand for? Absolutely, right? Exactly like the ray sensors in Pyrosim. Uh, servo motors that are controlling the, the legs. Okay. Uh, they took a page out of our book and looked at, again, physical damage. So here they've actually sliced off part of one of the robot's uh, legs. And when they do that, when they run the physical robot, uh, it doesn't travel that far. The goal, as always, is to try and move forward as quickly as possible. I'm going to walk you through their experiment in a moment, but this is looking at the experiment from the 10,000 foot view. Uh, first time it does this, second time it does this, and by the third trial, it's already recovered from damage. So one of the things you're going to notice in this project compared to ours back in 2006 is that this robot recovers much more rapidly than the evil starfish, and we're going to look at why and how it's able to, to do so. Okay, so uh, like us, uh, they also started with a simulated hexapod. This was an undamaged hexapod. Um, they evolved synaptic weights for a neural network controller for this hexapod, exactly like you were doing through all the assignments. And you remember our discussion about fitness landscapes. We have a very high dimensional search space of all possible controllers that can control our hexapod, right? Every point in this high dimensional space corresponds to a controller, and the height of that point in this high dimensional space represents the fitness, which in this case is how far the simulated hexapod robot moves from the origin. Right? This is a figure from the paper. They're trying to show you here a four dimensional hypercube, but of course this is a much, much larger dimensional search space. Right? So they're starting, the starting point for this experiment is exactly um, where we started as well. They then took all of these controllers that they were running on the simulated robot and they embedded those controllers in a much lower dimensional behavior space. So how do they do this? Remember in this case over here, each dimension of the high dimensional fitness landscape is one of the synapses, and the position along that dimension is the weight or value of that synapse. So for the quadruped, you had 32 synapses, so you had a 33-dimensional space, 32 horizontal dimensions corresponding to each of the 32 synaptic weights, and the 33rd dimension is fitness. In the cartoon example here, they've reduced this space down to two dimensions. And in these, this cartoon here, they describe uh, every point exists in this two-dimensional plane based on the fraction of time that this foot spent on the ground and this foot spent on the ground. So they took all of the controllers, they ran it on the hexapod, and they watched the fraction of time that these two feet spent on the ground. And that corresponded to a particular point in this space. So if we go to 0, 0, what controller is sitting at 0, 0? What does that controller make the hexapod do? Not it may move. We haven't said anything about movement yet, or at least distance. Both feet are off the ground, right? So these two dimensions here are reporting the fraction of time that those two feet spend on the ground. So this foot was off the ground, and this foot was off the ground, or sorry, not, um, yes, or I was off the ground for the entire time, uh, lifetime of the robot, zero, zero. These two legs spent 0% of the time on the ground. We're not sure yet whether the robot actually moved or not. It might have been using the other four legs to move or not. Right? So we're describing or we're embedding each controller in this lower dimensional space. Its position is based on the behavior it produces in the hexapod. Make sense? You'll notice that each point, so each point in this two-dimensional space corresponds to a controller. What do you think the color of the pixel represents? Is that controller? 
the fitness of that controller. So the more green the pixel is, the slower or not at all the hexapod moved, and the redder the pixel is, the faster the robot moved. So we, we could have drawn this as a three-dimensional space, putting the points at a height proportional to their fitness, but it's easier to look at this if we just have a two-dimensional contour plot where the heat of a pixel represents the speed of the robot. So far, so good? Okay, so I've described this cartoon so far as a two-dimensional space, but actually it's a six-dimensional space. Why six dimensions? The cartoon here is to help you build an intuition for what's going on, but this behavior space is actually six-dimensional. Is it a dimension for each of the behavioral aspects, and then a dimension for the performance, and then you have to double that for the confidence level? Uh, getting close. We haven't talked about this confidence level yet. We'll come back to that in a moment. We're just talking about this low dimensional behavioral space. Jack? One dimension for each leg. One dimension for each leg, right? So in this two dimensional cartoon example, each of these two dimensions corresponds to these two legs. It's actually a six dimensional space where each dimension reports the fraction of time that that leg spent on the ground. And they actually went to some effort to try and create a visualization of that six-dimensional space. So I'm going to hop, hop ahead here to uh, slide 18. I'll come back to the first slides in a moment. So here we go. We've got our dimension one and dimension two, which I'm sorry, actually corresponds to the two front legs. You'll notice that along these two dimensions, um, it's broken up into these five inset set of axes. So what they did was to actually take the fraction of time that these two legs spent on the ground and broke it into five discrete bins. So let's look at dimension one for a moment. If leg one spent 20% or less of the time on the ground, that controller was going to go somewhere into this box. If this leg spent between 20% and 40% of the time on the ground, the, the controller is going to be placed somewhere in here, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100 percent. So far, so good. If the second leg spent between 0 and 20 percent of the time on the ground, it's going to go somewhere in this row, 20 to 40 percent, 40 to 60 percent, 60 to 80 percent, 80 to 100 percent. So they're binning, they have a controller, they've run that on the simulated robot, and they're trying to figure out where in this six-dimensional space to drop that point. Let's imagine we have a controller that's going to go into this inset box here. That controller made the first and second leg uh, spend less than 20% of the time on the ground. So far, so good. Now we're going to look at this inset figure, and if you squint your eyes, you'll notice that this inset figure is also broken into five by five set of bins, or 25 bins. So they then look at dimension three and four, or leg three and four. If leg three spent uh, less than 20% of the time on the ground, it's going into that box. 20 to 40, that box, 40 to 60, that box, 60 to 80, that box, and 80 to 100, that box. So far, so good. So we look at the first two legs and figure out which of these larger boxes we're going to drop the point in. Then we look at the third and fourth leg, and within this inset set pair of axes, we figure out where it's going to drop in there. And you can't see it in this picture, but each of these smallest boxes is broken up one last time into five by five pixels based on the fraction of time that the fifth and the sixth leg spent on the ground. So far, so good. So this is an attempt to embed six dimensions down into two dimensions. And this is what it actually looks like. We're now looking at the relative fitness of, a vi of tens of thousands of controllers that have been run on the hexapod. Which controllers work well on the, on the hexapod and which ones didn't work so well?
takes a while to parse this, right? Because there's six variables. Um, yep. <clears throat> when all the legs are around like 50% of the time. When all the legs are about 50% of the time, so that would be about here and 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 about here. Exactly, right? So dead center in this graph, all six legs spent about 50% of the time on the ground, and that little blotch of red tells us that controllers around there are doing very well, right? You can see there's quite a bit of blue and green up here, which is actually kind of makes sense when you think about it. Why? What's going on in the upper right? All of the legs are touching the ground, right? Which kind of makes kind of makes sense. Okay, so how do they actually evolve these controllers? I haven't actually said anything about how to evolve these controllers yet, right? What they did was they started by creating a single random controller, run it on the simulated robot, and figure out where that point where that controller should go, and drop that controller into that point in this six-dimensional space. So we now have one colored pixel and everything else is white. They then take that controller, copy it, introduce a mutation, run that second controller on the hexapod. That second controller is probably going to get, make the hexapod do something slightly different. So it's going to, the six legs are going to spend a different fraction of the time on the ground, which means the position of that second controller is going to be somewhere else in the space drop that controller into that empty point, rinse and repeat. So I said there's tens of thousands of controllers here, there's probably hundreds of thousands. All right, so you just keep pulling controllers out of the space, mutating them, figure out where they should go, drop them into that space, and color that pixel based on how far the hexapod moved using that controller. What happens if you've just evaluated a controller and you go to put it into a slot that's already occupied by another controller? What do you think happens in that case? Can't have two controllers occupying the same slot, only one. Does it take the better of the two? Absolutely, right? So this is yet another variation of evolutionary selection. If there's already a controller sitting in that slot and a new one is, being, is trying to be placed inside, you take the one that makes the robot travel further. Repeat that process for as long as you like and you eventually get this picture. So far, so good? Okay, so let's go back to the cartoon, which again is showing things in two-dimensional space. Just remember that this behavior search space is actually a six-dimensional space. As I mentioned, there's this, uh, uh, you can see here there's this confidence level. We haven't talked about this yet. The confidence level uh, also has a pixel that corresponds to every pixel down here. So the confidence space is also six dimensions. And all the pixels are blue. What do you think that means? We've only run these controllers on the simulated hexapod so far. We've got our physical hexapod. What do you think confidence here represents? And what does blue confidence mean? Confidence about what? What do you think they're going to do next? Uh, try and cross the reality. They're going to try and cross the reality gap, right? So they're going to pick a controller from the behavior space and run it on the physical hexapod. Whichever controller they pick, there's another pixel that in the confidence space, and that pixel is blue. What does the fact that it's blue mean? Haven't tested it yet. They haven't tested it yet, so blue means nothing. Means low confidence, yeah. right? They haven't they haven't evaluated any of these hundreds of thousands of controllers on the physical hexapod yet, so they have low confidence, blue. Cool colors mean low, remember. So they have low confidence about all of these, but they're going to have to send one. Which one should they send to the physical hexapod? Which controller? The best one. The best one, right? Which is the reddest pixel, which is somewhere probably in the middle of this circle. Okay, so let's, I'm going to switch now to the video. 
So we're, we've done all this evolution now with the uh, simulated hexapod. So here's a video trying to summarize this six-dimensional space. We've got all these different controllers that produce different behavior. And each of these behaviors exist in different parts of the space. Right? OK. So let's have a look at the undamaged robot first. This is with a handmade controller. This is the classic uh, tripod gate. I'll play it again for you. You'll notice that three legs move together, and they move in antiphase to the other three legs. So that's sort of, at least as far as they know by hand designing a controller, about as good as this hexapod can, can do, which is traveling at 0.25 meters per second. Right? OK. Now they damage the robot. In this case, they did a whole bunch of different ways of damaging the robot. In this case, the leg just lost power. They didn't lop it off. They took that best controller, this one up here, which they believed was going to work well, because it worked well on the simulated undamaged hexapod. And as you can imagine, on the physical damaged robot, doesn't do much of anything, right? OK, so let's come back here for a moment. They just tried this controller. They thought it was going to do well. Actually, they didn't think it was going to do well. They had low confidence. It did well on the simulated robot. So they now, they tried out this position on the physical damaged robot. And they're now going to update both the behavior space. So you can see the behavior space now looks different than it did before. And they're going to update the confidence space. The confidence space now looks different than what it did before. Let's have a look at the behavior space first. What happened? How did they alter the behavior space? They did that area do work? Or just play with this? They, right, they cooled the pixel. They cooled the pixel that they actually transferred to the physical robot, and they cooled the controllers nearby. Right? So the intuition here is it's not just that controller that's going to do poorly on the physical robot, but similar controllers, similar in the sense that they cause the robot's legs to spend about the same fraction of time on the ground. Those similar controllers are also similarly going to fail to cross the reality gap. Make sense? So if you want to think this, think of this as like a contour pl plot of mountains and valleys, they took this mountain and they pushed it down, and it's now become a valley, right? Avoid this area. Controllers in this area don't work well. They've also altered the confidence space. What have they done to the confidence space? They displayed that the performance there is the best in the role. Not performance is the best. They know what it's going to do. They, they know what it's going to do, right? So this area, this pixel, this confidence pixel, which corresponds to the controller they just sent to the physical robot, has become maximally hot, right? Remember that hot means high and cool means low. So they have high confidence that this controller will not cross the reality gap. Right? However, they didn't just redden this pixel. They also heated pixels nearby. Right? And the further away that pixel was from this pixel, they heated it less. What does that mean? Jeff? Because they tested the one right in the center, they're very confident that it doesn't work. Yep. And they think a similar controller is going to work well, so they're not as confident as this one. They're not as confident, right? So in these bands of yellow and green, it's sort of medium confidence, right? They say, these pixels here in this yellow and green band, we have medium confidence that we'll get this result. These colors tell us the prediction about how this controller is going to work on the physical robot. We're not so sure about those. Pretty sure, because they're close to the one we just transferred or tried to transfer, but not so sure. All the rest of this remains blue, which means what? Not good. 
not confident at all, right? Have no idea about everything out here. Okay, I was going to ask you which controller they send to the physical robot next, but panel D already uh, gives you the punchline, right? They're picking this point out here. Now, up till this point, we've been we, we're under the impression that the controller they're sending to the physical robot is the reddest or the hottest pixel in the behavior space. It's not just based on the heat of the pixel in the behavior space. What else influences which controller we send to the physical robot? A uh, variation, possibly, so they could say, let's try something that's as far from this controller as possible. They're actually taking the heat, or the fitness, if you like, of each controller down here and multiplying the fitness of that controller by its confidence level. So if you want to think about it this way, let's say we have a pixel that has very high fitness but very low confidence. You multiply those two together and you get something sort of medium. Here we have something that is low and something that has high confidence. You multiply those together, also medium to low. What you're looking for is a pixel somewhere where you have, uh, where is that pixel has high fitness and you have relatively high confidence that it's going to transfer well to the physical robot. We don't have that yet, right? Most of the confidence space is still all blue. The, we're still pretty unsure about which ones will transfer. So at this point, by multiplying each pixel in the behavior space by its corresponding pixel in the confidence space, the highest result of those multiplications is still probably going to be the most fit controller. So far, so good? OK. So back we go. Let's just back up here a little bit. OK, so we're going to now watch that first one that was, that was sent across the reality gap and failed miserably. Now we found the second one, and we're going to send that second one across. In a moment. I'll just pause here for a moment. They mentioned Bayesian op um, optimization, for, so for the statistics major here. Bayesian, just if you have an, influ uh, an intuition about this, a Bayesian approach to this problem is saying, we're going to do things based on how good it did uh, in simulation, multiplied by our confidence that it's going to transfer across the gap. Right? We already have an idea about our confidence that something will work or not. That's the Bayesian part of this. A little bit better, right? Probably just by chance that it was a little bit better. Here we can actually see the, uh, the map. And actually, I'm going to play this one again. Watch now, not the, con not the behavior of uh, the hexapod, but watch the six-dimensional behavior space. So they picked this point out here, which is quite red. And it transfers OK. They're going to change the colors of the pixels. So you'll notice now that this pixel they tried before is now blue, so sort of medium. right? They've just updated this behavior space. OK. So let's come, back. let's come back to our cartoon here. We just evaluated the second controller. That one in this little cartoon here, it also did not that great. They increased the confidence around that second uh, attempt. They then tried out a third one. This one did pretty well in cr crossing the reality gap. And the confidence now goes up as well. So now they're sure that that this third one did pretty well, the next one that they're going to pick to send, the fourth one they're going to send to the physical robot is going to probably be picked from this area. right? Imagine you multiply the fitness of this pixel by confidence. right? That's going to give you a pretty high value. 
So they're starting to isolate a place in behavior space where there are controllers that are transferring well to reality. Make sense? Okay. All right, so that was the second one. Here's the third one. Or is this the second one again? Oh, this third one. Second one, second one. Third one. They're going to update the behavior space again. Fourth one. Fifth one. Okay, this one travels 0.24 meters per second, which is almost as fast as the classic tripod gate on the undamaged robot, which was 0.25 meters per second. So not only have they recovered some functionality, they've recovered pretty much all functionality, at least relative to that manually devised controller. And they did it in 32 seconds. So this is the big advance over the work we did back in 2006, where we were doing all this offline simulation where the robot was updating a self-model and so on. This robot has no self-model. All it has is this sort of distributed sense of what kinds of controllers are going to work well and which ones aren't. Make sense? Okay. So huge advantage here because obviously we can our robot can recover damage much faster. What's the disadvantage of this approach? If there is one. Could it be possible that there's not a point in the space that possible, right? So they did generate a very large number of controllers before, and they embedded them in a space based on the fraction of time that the six legs spent on the ground. But you've got to hope that whatever went wrong with this robot, there is at least one controller in the space of several hundred thousand that will recover damage, right? And at least in the situations they looked at, most of the time that was, was true. So um, this work builds on the work we did in 2006, but there's still this open question of how should a machine recover from unanticipated situations? Should you generate a large library of contingency plans beforehand and then figure out which ones, if any, will recover solutions? Do you go with the approach that we used back in 2006, where we had a robot that was continuously trying to model or figure out what was going on? And then once it figured out what was going on, it spent some time evolving a controller to overcome that situation. It's a slow process, might not, also might not always work. So still sort of an open area of uh, investigation. Make sense? OK. So as I mentioned, they looked at, uh, in the case of the hexapod, they looked at five different situations. Uh, condition one, C1 there, that was the undamaged uh, hexapod. In C2, they lopped off part of uh, one of the legs. C3, the, uh, motor, uh, the motor just stops responding altogether. In C4, they cut off an entire leg. In C5, they cut off two legs altogether. Poor C5 robot is going to have a pretty difficult time here. We'll see how well it does in a moment. And C6, something is broken off, and somebody's put a little wooden leg on this, this robot. Right? Remember, this, this work was originally funded by NASA when we send robot probes to the outer moons of the solar system. If something unexpected happens there, the robot can recover. So in this crit case, a little green man has come and put a little wooden uh, stump on the robot's leg. Okay, so we've got these five damage situations. How well did it do? Let's have a look here. So uh, we've got C1 through C6 listed here. The star, the yellow star, represents the speed that that robot travels using the classic alternating tripod gate. 
why is the yellow star so much higher in C1 than it is in C2 through C6? What does that tell you? So we've got these six robots, C1 through C6. We try the alternating tripod gate on each of them. It's symmetric on both sides, that's right. So we're actually not modeling the hexapod here, right? We're just taking this alternating tripod gate and trying it on each of these six robots. And you're right, partly because C1 is symmetric, that alternating tripod gate works pretty well on C1. It causes the robot to travel at 0.25 meters per second, as we saw in the video. The alternating tripod gate does not work very well on all the other five damaged robots, which kind of makes sense, right? Okay, so they then ran this uh, experiment that I just walked you through. They ran it on the undamaged robot, and they, they actually found controllers in that six-dimensional behavior space that caused the robot to move faster than the classic alternating tripod gate, right? This is yet one more piece of evidence that it's really hard to sit down and manually create a controller for a robot. It's hard to imagine something that would get the robot to travel faster than the alternating tripod gate, but apparently there is. Okay. What happened here, so these blue bars uh, are much higher than the yellow stars. What does that tell you? Could be that there are controllers that are better than the uh, what would you call it? The tri well, tripod gate. Yeah. Dep much better, right? So now the blue the blue bars are much higher than the yellow stars in C two through C six than they than they are in C one, right? So we're recovering. The robot really goes slowly with these alternating tri tripod gates, and we can find or this algorithm can find other ways of getting the de these five damaged robots to move um, relatively quickly. And some of these bars, as you can see here, these bars are overlapping the yellow star here. What does that tell you? The fact that the blue bars in C2 through C6 are at about the same height as the yellow star in C1. What does that mean? Those controllers run on the damaged robot are almost just as good as the uh, tripod gate on an undamaged robot. Exactly, right? So we're recovering, we can sort of quantify how good or how much recovery we're getting out of these damaged robots, right? Um, C5 is the case where the robot is missing two legs, and not surprisingly, the blue bar is, uh, is further down compared to the other five, five bars, right? That kind of makes sense. Okay, um, C1 through C3, or C1 and C3 over here, it says alternative, alternative descriptor. Remember that we were embedding all of our controllers, which initially are in a very high dimensional space, down into this six dimensional space. And we're describing that six dimensional space based on the fraction of time that the, the legs spent on the ground. But that's kind of an arbitrary decision about how to describe behaviors, right? We're describing the behavior of any individual controller by the fraction of time each of the six legs spend on the ground. We could choose an alternative descriptor, and I don't remember what they actually chose. We'd have to go back and look at the actual paper. But I think it was something to do with how much the, uh, how much the robot turned as it was moving how much clockwise and how much counterclockwise. And I think they also use tilt, how much the main body was tilting, Some, something like that. Right? So we can just measure those things, create new dimensions. We don't necessarily need six, could be something else. Embed or evolve controllers and stick them into that alternative descriptor space and see how well we do in this case. And we can see again in the undamaged case, uh, we did pretty well, and C3 
did about as well as C3 did with the initial descriptor. Why did they bother doing these additional two experiments, C1 and C3, using this alternative descriptor? Why bother? What's the message they're trying to send with those these additional experiments? I think that uh, they, they try to convince the reader that uh, the algorithm is robust. The algorithm is robust, right? So again, how do we know that we have a controller in that space that's going to allow the robot to recover damage? Maybe it's because they chose fraction of time that each of the six legs spent on the ground but maybe something else would work as well. And this alternative descriptor that they chose, at least for C1 and C3, seemed to do pretty well. Um, I was wondering why they didn't do C2, C4, C and C5. Probably ran out of time, I would guess. You can only do so much as you're discovering in your final project. OK. Here's uh, the same results, but plotted in a different way. Now they're plotting the time it takes to recover. So um, on average, they're able to recover uh, or extend, improve the behavior in less than a minute, about 30 seconds time. And in the other cases, it took uh, a little more than a minute or a little less. C5, not surprisingly, it took them longer, more time to recover less well. But that's not surprising, right? You're gonna have to, this robot is gonna have to do a lot more work to recover forward travel after this, this damage. Okay. They're also plotting the number of trials. So how many controllers did they have to send across the reality gap until they got these levels of performance? And it's not too bad, right? Half a dozen, 10, 12, sort of reasonable, right? Makes, makes sense. Okay. Turns out they did a second experiment, again, to try and prove the robustness of this. Were there results specific to the fact that they were using a hexapod robot and these five different kinds of damage? So they also ran exactly the same experiment, but now on a robot arm. And I'll let them explain this experiment. They included one last video to show you that the recover, the compensating gait is dynamic. Remember our discussion about legged locomotion. A gait is dynamic if most of the legs come off the ground. If the robot's center of mass is outside its polygon of support. Its polygon of support is defined by where it's touching the ground, right? If your center of weight goes forward of your feet, you'll start to fall over. So here we go now, the second experiment with the robot arm. Here's the undamaged robot arm. The behavior, uh, a successful behavior with, in the undamaged case. Now we have an unresponsive joint. So if you send commands to that joint, nothing happens. Not very successful. Notice the behavior performance map now, the shape of it. Actually, let's pause this. Why do we not have a square like we did before? What is this radius of circle? So they're showing you again this behavior uh, performance map. In the case of the hexapod, it was actually a six-dimensional space. Now you can see Things are a little bit more clear. We're dealing with a two-dimensional space. But it's not Cartesian anymore. It's polar coordinates. Why? That's the strong hint here. Circle is the range of the imagination of the area. Exactly. So the, the distance from the center of this circle is the distance the arm can reach, right? So you can sort of see um, the arm actually embedded in the behavior space. So each point in this two-dimensional behavior space corresponds to the point that the hand reaches, right? 
success. So we just watched we just watched one example of some damage to the robot arm, which was this unresponsive joint. They looked at 14 different ways of damaging the arm, and they showed in all these 14 cases they were able to recover functionality after allowing the arm to try and transfer a few just a few controllers from simulation to reality. Okay, I think that's pretty much everything in the video here. Ah, this shows the classic tripod gate on one of the damaged robots. So you can see uh, that it doesn't do very well. And here's compensating when you're missing part of your leg. Actually faster than the original, the original one. Actually, let's just look at a few more of these. Okay. Okay, so uh, back to the robot arm here for a moment. Here are just three of those 14 different damage situations they look at. Here is the case where the joint is stuck at 45 degrees. The robot doesn't know that that's what's happened, but it's updating that behavior space. Um, and here is a joint with a permanent 45% uh, offset, um, and they're combining these to produce C3. So three different damage situations, and they were able to recover functionality for the arm in about 15 or 20 seconds using five or eight trials on, on average. Okay. Just to sort of reinforce what we've talked about now, here back at the uh, hexapod robot, here is the walk that the physical robot does through its mental catalog of all these controllers that it has. And let's see if we can find the starting point. So it started with this controller, tried this one out, updated the behavior space and then the confidence space. At that point, this was the reddest pixel in the behavior space. It tried this one out. This one didn't work. As you can see, it turned pretty blue, but initially it was pretty red. Then they tried out this third one down here, things are actually sort of red. They stay red around here, so it's sort of in the right ballpark. In this case, it left that part of the space and moved into this part of the space because this part was pretty red. Tried that one out. That definitely didn't work. Hopped over here. This part was pretty red. That didn't work. That didn't work. Back to here, to this part of the space where it was able to recover after one, two, three, four, five, six, in this case, seven trials. Okay, I think we will stop there for today. Just as a reminder, this lecture probably would have fit better with the reality gap uh, issue. Last lecture on Thursday, we're gonna have a guest speaker, uh, Nick Cheney, who's gonna tell you a little bit about soft robots. You do have a quiz due uh, tonight. Um, please read through that final project document if you haven't already, just to make sure you're clear on the details. And we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.